I think the real core danger that we're, we're having in California is things that used to shock us are now becoming normalized. This spike in homelessness, spike in increased severity of mental illness and people living on homeless, and increasingly the policymakers are asking us to just accept that that's normal. State's policy right now, which has been housing first, right, just give them homes. Almost half of the people in jail or prison are mentally ill and drug addicted. If you can put them into housing, they're still dysfunctional. So what happened was people were in these mental institutions and then we let them out without having a plan for them. The failure to build community treatment facilities is their jails and prisons quickly filled up with people who are mentally ill. But to go from 165,000 down to 85 or 90,000 inmates in a relatively short period of time, we've gone too far in the other direction. My guest today is Vern Pearson, District Attorney of El Dorado County in Northern California. He also served several years with California's Department of Justice as Deputy Attorney General. Why does California release the mentally ill from jails to the street instead of providing care for them? Have we created a cycle of homelessness? We'll find out in today's episode. I'm Siamai Korami. Welcome to California Insider. Well, thank you for having me. We want to talk to you about homelessness in California. There is a trend, and as we see more and more homeless people in California, can you explain to us how we got here? Well, it's important to know where we are then, too. So, so in particular, in terms of California, so between 2014 and 2020, throughout the United States, homelessness went up about 9% uh, overall. Uh, but during that same period from 2014 to 2020, here in California, it went up by 43%. Wow. So you have to stop and th say, yes, homelessness has gone up uh, nationwide, but such a huge percentage of it is here in California. And I digging into the numbers a little bit, we have 12% of the total population in the United States, yet 25% of all the homelessness are here in California. So when we, when we look at that and we say, okay, so what's happened? What are the changes? And there were some fairly significant policy shifts that took place uh, between 2013, 2014 on to about 2015 that really took until about the time the uh, pandemic started to really take hold. And then now over the last two and a half years of the pandemic, they've really taken off. So this problem didn't start then. And really the root of the problem is in uh, something called back in the 1960s, 1970s, uh, this concept of deinstitutionalization. In other words, we had people being institutionalized here in the United States and here in California for things that they really never should have been put in an institution. Someone with Down syndrome. There was so a, this was the mental institutions? Yes, the mental, what they were called mental hospitals at that time. Mm. But they were much more like dungeons than, than actual hospitals. And uh, uh, President Kennedy signed an executive order and there was a, a family member that he had that had been institutionalized against her will um, for no real good reason. And uh, there was a movement that swept through Europe, through the United States to deinstitutionalize, to close those mental hospitals, uh, uh, not put people in that situation where they really shouldn't be in, in a locked facility. Um, the idea was that we would create these community treatment facilities um, here in California, much like they did in Europe. And so to understand it's like, it wasn't just here uh, that we had deinstitutionalized, it was across Europe, and then in the United States and, and here in California. Europe built community treatment facilities and they actually treat uh, mental illness and drug addiction at the local level. We planned on doing that here, but we never actually did it. Instead, we did this thing called an LPS conservatorship and we would conserve people. Uh, famous case being Britney Spears recently. Uh, that's a conservatorship, but it's a very different kind of conservatorship than, than what we're talking about. So, but what ended up happening is in the years following this deinstitutionalization and the failure to build community treatment facilities is their jails and prisons quickly filled up with people who are mentally ill. 
So here, in, in depending on the numbers and the studies that you look at, in California, between 40 and 50 percent of the people that are in a locked facility, a, a jail or a prison, have some level of mental illness. And typically, they also have some level of drug addiction. So we say almost half of the people in jail or prison are mentally ill and drug addicted. So when you stop and compare that and say, look at countries like uh, the UK or Italy, they have very small numbers of mentally ill, but they also have ability to treat people at the local level uh, that we simply did not do here. So we put these people, these people ended up in prison? Yeah, so they went from mental hospitals out on the street and the size of our jails and prisons uh, essentially doubled within about a 10 year period. Uh, and a large percentage of those people were put into jails and prisons and they would do, early on in my career, in the 1990s, I heard the expression life on the installment plan. In other words, there were people who are suffering from drug addiction, suffering from mental illness or the combination, and they would commit low-level property crimes. When I say low-level, felony type, but low, lower level. So like stealing uh, a car or something. Right, stealing a car, burglarizing a house, and they were doing it to support their drug uh, addiction. Uh, to, to so because of the mental illness, whatever type of crime. And so these people would come in, and, rather than being in a mental hospital, they're going in and out of jails. And, and what would happen, jail or prison, what would happen is a person would be living on the street, they would be not able to take care of themselves, they commit a crime, they come into custody, and as soon as they come into custody, they sleep normal hours, they eat normal food, they're, they're getting treatment of some kind during that time period, and suddenly they seem much better. Um, over time, they get released back out of custody, and then they begin this process of decompensation where they, they start using drugs again, they don't sleep normal hours, they don't eat normal food, they're dehydrated, what all the different circumstances, and they decompensate, um, and they get worse and worse, and then they get rearrested again and that hence life on the installment plan. They're in custody, they get better, they get out of custody, they get worse. And, and to be clear, I'm not an advocate for someone who's mentally ill or drug addicted being in jail or prison. That's not where they should be. But we also can't do nothing. And what we're doing now since 2014 is essentially nothing. And so rather than getting, having those people come in and out of custody and get better and then worse, get treated while they're in custody and they get worse again, we're simply just having them uh, uh, living on our streets and increasing number of homelessness, dramatic increases in homelessness. You can't go into any city in, in California today without seeing large numbers of homelessness. Now, so what happened was people were in these in mental institutions and then we let them out without having a plan for them. They ended up committing crime and we ended up putting them in prison. Right. The population of prison went up. Right. Then we decided to let them out of the prisons right. because it was, right. and, and now we have them in the streets. Exactly, and I would say that it's probably, you know, there was the, the first deinstitutionalization that took place in the 60s and 70s, uh, and then the second one in, in the 2000 teens, that was maybe, call it 2.0, deinstitutionalization 2.0, where we started letting, saying those low-level offenders uh, we're going to decriminalize low-level property crimes, decriminalize uh, drug use, and um, you simply live on the street. And so what we're seeing in places like the Tenderloin area of San Francisco to where there's mass numbers of people who are using drugs out on the street. And the solution that San Francisco and LA and now increasingly in California is to do a policy called harm reduction. So harm reduction essentially says, don't tell people that the drugs they're taking are likely to kill them, as they will over time. Instead, have a doctor or a nurse available, have Narcan available, and reduce the harm uh, to them. Let them have a, a, supply them with syringes so they can use their drugs that way. But reduce the, the short-term harm. But by reducing the short-term harm, we're ignoring the long-term harm, both on that individual and on society at large. So what's been the plan? So it looks like this has happened, but there hasn't been a clear plan. Well, unless there's a plan to fail. I mean, that's the, about the best way I can put it. The state of California's approach has been somewhat dysfunctional. I mean, uh, uh, when we look at homelessness overall, I I is it caused by 
uh, in part by how expensive California is. Of course it is. When you look at the numbers uh, uh, to where it's a, it, as much as you know, eight or $900,000 per housing unit in LA County, it's one, it's, it's bureaucratically, it's ridiculous how much that it would cost that much, but it is very expensive to live here. So that is part of the problem. But then you combine the dysfunctionality of the people uh, who this class of population that we're talking about that are either uh, uh, daily using controlled substances uh, uh, and combined with a mental illness of some kind, even if you can, you know, to follow the housing first approach, which has been advocated by the state of California, if you can put them into housing, they're still dysfunctional uh, because of these underlying problems that we're talking about. So the state's policy right now, which has been housing first, right, just give right. them homes, is it only going after one piece of the... It's one piece, and there is, a, there is a percentage of people who greatly benefit from housing first. There are, there are single mothers, for instance, probably the, the, the most notable one, single mothers who uh, are not getting regular child support payments uh, from the father, and they're you know, they are, they're not in an ability to support themselves. Housing first then for, for that population, uh, it, it makes all the sense in the world. Provide reasonable housing for the kids and for the mother and then let them work into something else over a period of time. That's one thing. But for this population that we're talking about to where many of them, the biggest problem, and they become what's called chronically homeless. In other words, they can place them in hou housing of some kind, and then they become homeless again. Those people oftentimes do not want to live uh, in a structured environment. They don't want to stop using uh, controlled substances. They don't want to take uh, whatever the treatment might be for the mental illness. And they're essentially choosing to live in that manner. And as a society, at some point we have to ask ourselves, um, we're doing these things out of compassion, but how is it compassionate to let someone die in a ditch uh, with a needle in their arm? How is it compassionate that, that, that some of the homelessness that we see where people are so dysfunctional that uh, there was a person that went on a ride along with San Francisco PD that I spoke with, and they said the, the first call that they went out to, two officers and the individual they made contact with was dressed from the waist above and not from the waist below, who was sitting uh, uh, in his own feces. And these two officers are having to deal with this, uh, this problem uh, and this person that's in this problem. And how is it compassionate to let someone live that way uh, when there's an alternative? And the alternative is to get them off the drugs, get them the appropriate treatment. And, and really, there, there are solutions here. The solutions, though, involve changing the laws and permitting, uh, uh, like Europe does, uh, community treatment, having enough care providers, having the right type of care providers, and having the ability to uh, uh, get the person to stay on at some type of a program. Now, in terms of the drug use and the way this community is set up in Tenderloin and other places where people are intense and they do drugs, it seems like we've become very relaxed towards drugs. Right? Yeah. We just... Yeah, yeah I, I think that's very true. And I, I, I think the real core danger that we're, we're having in California is things that used to shock us are now becoming normalized. In other words, bad public policy, things like Prop 47, uh, this thing called AB 109 realignment, it caused this spike in homelessness, spike in, in increased uh, uh, severity of mental illness and people living on homeless and increasingly the policymakers are asking us to just accept that that's normal and um, uh, uh, well rather than having someone sticking a needle in their arm and using drugs in an apartment somewhere or out on the street let's create a facility and let's normalize that behavior rather than just saying oh, wait a second you shouldn't be using uh, uh, IV, you know, IV drugs. They can and will eventually kill you, and kind of having a different type of an approach. Was it like that before? There was a process before that the yeah. people would have to well, one go of the to rehab, right? Yeah, and, and one of the most successful things that California did uh, up until 2014 was called a drug court. Um, we had this this ability to where 
uh, and it was a non-adversarial court where it would be people who were either arrested for uh, uh, controlled substances offenses or offenses that were related to that. In other words, they were stealing or burglarizing a house to support their, their drug problem. And they could get into what's called drug court. The, the drug court judge would meet with them on a regular basis and they had an attorney, typically a public defender, there was a prosecutor that was there. But it was much more of a collaborative type of approach to where uh, the, ju the judge would say, if you stay off drugs, if you get a, if you get a clean test, I will have, give you greater flexibility in terms of where you live, circumstances. If you have a dirty test, the court can do what's called flash incarceration. So where the person would say, hey, if you get a dirty test, meaning drug use, um, you can go back into jail for 72 hours or for a week um, as an incentive for the person to stay uh, in rehab. Um, because we, as I said, deinstitutional or decriminalized drug use and we decriminalized those low-level property crimes, uh, what we found was in, over the last 10 years, 8 to 10 years, the drug court simply dried up. No one wants to be in a drug court that has consequences in it because if they either don't show up for court or they show up for court and they plead guilty, they will simply be released uh, with no, uh, no accountability and no consequences. So was the idea to get rid of or weaken these drug courts, was it to make sure people don't go to prison? But is that, is that the reason we I, I, I What think happened it, there? I think it was sold, you know, Prop 47, Prop 57, uh, AB 109 was sold to the public uh, with a series of deals with different organizations as uh, we're incarcerating too many people, we need, to, we need to decarcerate was one of the expressions that was used. And there's some kernel of truth to that to where there were people that were receiving sentences that were disproportionate for what they'd actually done. Uh, that did happen. But to go from 165,000 down to uh, 85 or 90,000 inmates in a relatively short period of time, we've gone far too, too far in the other direction. And uh, uh, the system simply has failed. And one of the parts of this that, that has not gotten enough attention, during the same period of time, there is this the segment of the criminal population uh, that we would characterize as incompetent to stand trial. So when someone gets arrested, they've committed a crime, and they need to, they get an attorney appointed for, for them at taxpayer expense. The attorney meets with them and they need to assist the attorney. In other words, tell the attorney what they did or didn't do, be able to answer questions, things like that. Over the last eight years, the incompetent to stand trial population has essentially doubled. Our state mental hospitals are full of these people that because, because of these changes that I talked about, very well intentioned but not well thought out uh, policy changes, that population is doubled. And we have a huge number of people that are not able to assist their lawyers. And so they, they, they remain in custody until they can be restored to sanity is the expression. Now, another uh, thought is that when we, we, we are told that we have more people in prisons than Europe does. Right. Is it what they did was they actually had other institutions. They have institutions and they have community treatment facilities. So if you, I, I, the numbers are dramatically smaller of people that are mentally ill and in jail or prison in the UK, in Italy, in France, uh, in all of Europe as compared to the United States and in particular here in California. In other words, as I said, 40 to 50% of the people in custody in the United States and in particular in California are uh, uh, some level of mental illness, oftentimes significantly mentally ill, um, before they came into custody, and they remain so oftentimes after they're in custody. That's very different than the experience that Europe has. Governor Newsom recently proposed a care court. Uh, can you tell us what you think about this? What the care court is trying to do is to, to make California a little bit more like the European model, where there's a community treatment facility and there's the legal mechanism to cause someone to stay within treatment uh, or in rehab. And it, it, it's a very good idea, it's one that I support, but the problem like in so many things is the, you know, the devil's in the details and how it's actually implemented uh, will, will mean it's success or failure. 
who do you think is going to implement this? Well, the, the state of California says it's going to, and it's going to do it at the community level. The problem is it's going to take a significant amount of funding. We do not have enough licensed uh, therapists or caregivers here in California, or anywhere near. Um, it, you know, psychologists, psychiatrists, there's not enough of them, and we simply don't fund or pay for them uh, at adequate numbers. And we've been hearing this, that, that even when people want to deal with their drug addiction, and they're ready, there's not enough space. Or there's there's not enough space, yeah. It's a real problem to where you have, you have family, there's, there's such a multifaceted problem. You have family members who have a loved one that they, they care about and they want what's best for them, but they're an adult. And so if they try to, they are able to get them to a caregiver, the caregiver will tell them, HIPAA, I can't discuss the specifics with you, things like that. And that's if they can get into a caregiver. There's simply not enough providers here in California to deal with the magnitude of the problem. And the pandemic and COVID has only made it worse. The, the lockdowns, the discord that's going on, uh, in, in, in the public discourse and, and the, the, the agitation that, that I think people are uh, experiencing is, is aggravating an already bad problem. It looks like we're putting all of our resources into this housing first where we're building really expensive apartments, uh, especially yeah. in LA, a yeah. studio at $800,000. Do you think that some of this funding should go, or a lot of this funding should go to programs like this? I, d I definitely think that w we, there's no question it is very expensive to be housed here in, in California. There's no question. But when someone is dysfunctional, uh, there's someone who is, uh, they prefer to the extent that they have a preference, but they prefer to live uh, uh, with a needle in their arm on the streets or to uh, uh, in a ditch or whatever the might circumstance might be. Um, we have a problem and simply providing them uh, uh, housing is not going to fix the problem. Now in terms of the drug use and living on the street, h how does it work? Is it simple to do that? Yeah, and we've done a number of interviews with people. You go out and talk to them, anybody. I mean, if you want to go in there, I know there's been some documentaries where people have gone out and talked to homeless uh, people, the, the homeless population. I, there's reoccurring trends in terms of it's not hard to see. There's a significant percentage, not all, but significant percentage are current drug users of some kind uh, that they're also mentally ill. Oftentimes they're on uh, state or federal disability because they are disabled because of their drug use, their mental illness. So they're getting paid money by the government um, every month uh, or they steal to support their drug habit and their lifestyle. And it's, uh, frankly, I in many respects, it's, it's not a, a well-informed choice, but it is in many respects for many instances of this population, the chronically home, homeless, it's a choice. They're choosing to live that way. And our policies doesn't do anything to, to kind of intervene. No. It seems like the drug courts used to do that, right? The drug courts did. The drug courts were very successful to inter in intervening, getting people off of it. Uh, I spoke on a panel recently with an individual that had been arrested probably a dozen times in San Francisco. And he said the officer, one of the officers that, that arrested him the most number of times, it was the same officer, eventually was able to get to him and say, you know, eventually you're going to die from what you're doing. So I'm going to keep arresting you for what it is that you're doing. And that eventually had an effect on him and caused him uh, to get off the drugs and, and get off the street. And he's doing well now. I don't think there's any compassion in letting somebody die on the street with a needle stuck in their arm. And I think w when we're doing things and we have compassion and we're well-intentioned, it doesn't mean that we're well-informed and that the policy is well thought out. Now for us to ch make a change in this homeless, homelessness, the population that we have, you mentioned is above the average of, of the much higher than the national average. Right. Do we have to change Prop 47? How do we fix it? Well, we need to change Prop 47. Is, uh, personally, I would just like to see Prop 47 repealed. Uh, but you have to start somewhere, and we have to start saying things like the uh, petty theft with a prior. In other words, it used to be prior to Prop 47, if you stole multiple times, it would be considered 
uh, the subsequent thefts would be considered a felony. That's called petty theft with a prior. And the way it's, it, it, it's, it is now, there is no consequence. You can steal over and over and over and over again uh, dozens of times, and there's documented histories of people with dozens of arrests for theft all being treated as misdemeanors. And the practical reality here in California, for the most part, a misdemeanor means very little consequence. So people can keep doing it and doing it and yeah. living the lifestyle. Right. Is there any other things that we need to consider to, to get out of this situation we're in? Yeah, and we have to do something with the, the, the treatment. And drugs, right? Yeah, or the drugs. Or, or yeah. mental illness. Yeah, mental illness and drugs. I, it, we, we have a, society has changed in the last several years to where uh, people on their smartphones, use of drugs, they're able to uh, affect a, a chemical reaction in their body that they're, you know, when, when a, a, the likes on a phone sweeping left and right on these various dating apps, they give you a, a, a physiological reaction that people are becoming increasingly addicted to. And somehow we have to find a way of how that is working together with mental illness uh, and drug addiction to break that cycle. And sometimes it's being in a locked facility. Um, sometimes that's the only way that you can effectuate that. Now, in terms of uh, when people look around in LA, in San Francisco, and people living in these uh, areas in California, some people might feel very down, and they, they, some may not understand why this is happening. Something is cost of living, something it's policy, and some people may may either want to leave, or they right. they don't want to deal with this. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I certainly don't want to leave the state, but I, I see a daily, in the community where I live, I see people every day moving from the Bay Area to El Dorado County, to Placer County, and the, the neighboring county. And I ask them, it's like, why are you moving here from the Bay Area? And they're like, well, because I don't want my kids to get off a bus and walk over bro you know, needles and, and uh, uh, homelessness and things like that. Um, and your county has uh, among the lowest c per capita crime in California, if not the lowest. Um, so we want to we want to live that way. And I said, well, it's important to recognize the bad policy decisions that were made in cities like San Francisco or L.A. and fix the prop, you know, the policy decisions. Why can't we fix the policy? And so I have optimism that the, the, we'll hit a tipping point where the public becomes aware, shows like this talking about it, and hopefully the public becomes aware and takes action and, set, and holds you know, their re elected representatives accountable. Do you have any other thoughts for our audience? No, I appreciate you talking about it and, and not trying to ad address a complex problem with the 30 second sound bite because it doesn't, you can't fix things that way. You can talk about them and you can stir up people's emotions, but you really can't fix a problem that's this complicated uh, by just a 30 second sound bite. So thank you for talking about it. Vern Pearson, District Attorney of El Dorado County, it was great to have you on California Insider. Thank you for having me. Click the link in the description below and subscribe to the new California Insider channel. Starting from today, we'll post new episodes on this channel. We'll see you there.